Welcome, everybody. The title of this conversation, shall I say, is going to be starting the conversation about bowel urgency in patients with Crohn's disease. I know typically people are used to seeing bowel urgency in patients with ulcerative colitis, so we're going to change this now and really focus on um, the sort of introduction of this concept in patients with Crohn's disease, and Millie's done a lot of work in this as well. Um, just as a reminder that this is a program um, that is uh, supported by an educational grant by Lilly, and also that uh, CME Outfitters is a joint accreditation provider and as such develops and certifies continuing education activities for the team, by the team, including our program today. That's not mine, that's theirs. I guess I should introduce myself. Um, I am Marla Dubinsky um, from Mount Sinai in New York, uh, and I'm really delighted to be joined here um, by Dr. Millie Long and Dr. Tosifa Lee, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves as I pull up their uh, credits here. Hey, thanks, Marla. I'm Tosifa Lee. Hello, everyone. I am a medical director at SSM Health Crohn's and Colitis Center in Oklahoma City where I practice and take care of uh, IBD patients. And I'm Millie Long. I'm at University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, uh, where I also practice in our IBD center and, and direct our uh, fellowship as well um, for UNC in gastroenterology and hepatology. Well, we've got folks who are uh, on the ground doing this kind of work, so um, thank you both for joining me. So just as a reminder about our learning objectives, of course, which is to recognize the frequency of bowel urgency in patients with Crohn's and the impact uh, on the patient's quality of life. How do we incorporate these assessments of bowel urgency as part of our evaluation for patients with Crohn's and engage uh, patients in open communication of their bowel urgency as part of shared decision making? But I think um, Dr. Ali is going to walk us through really how do we think about urgency in our, in our patients and sort of what are the approaches. Before we actually start digging into the meat or the content that Millie's going to start with, I do want to remind you why we're here. This is why we're here. So I'm going to have you um, meet our patient who's going to remind us about why we get up every day and do what we want to do and why everybody else in the room also gets up every day to do what they want to do, which is change the lives of the patients we treat. I'm McCall McCarty. I'm a senior at OU. I'm an acting major with a communications minor. The spring of 2021, I got terribly sick. I started to get like these canker sores in my mouth. Eating was absolutely horrible. Literally just drinking water burned. I went to the emergency room and they did a scan of my body and they realized that I was so incredibly inflamed. I had sores covering every inch of my insides, literally from my mouth to my rectum. And so that's when they realized that I was actually in like the height of a Crohn's flare and I had absolutely no idea that Crohn's was even a disease. See how emotional she got just talking about remembering it. Is that your patient? Yeah. Okay. Um, really important because I think she was having a little bit of reminding herself of how sick she was, and I think that itself really also is important for us to remember how this disease impacts the patients. But So first we're going to just do uh, audience response here. You won't show the results. We'll come back and circle back at the very end to see whether or not our conversation has actually changed the way we incorporate uh, bowel urgency assessments. So the question as stated is how often do you incorporate bowel urgency assessments into your evaluation of patients with Crohn's disease? There's no right or wrong answer. Wonderful. Let's dive into the case, because I think it's impossible to really understand urgency in this totality without actually understanding how do patients present and what types of patients. I'd say that everybody assumes that you only have urgency when you have active rectal disease. I could swear that would probably be something for the last right. 30 years or so we've thought about, and here we are going to have a conversation that's nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And I think the Crohn story blows this, that whole theory out of the water. And I remember seeing some of the data for the first time, Millie, I was like, this is impossible. This is a UC patient, right? So it even really struck me about understanding. So this is Susie M., who's a 28-year-old uh, female patient. She was diagnosed with Crohn's disease two years ago. Her initial treatment, <laughs> as usual, is steroids and a non-approved therapy for Crohn's 
Crohn's disease, which is 5-ASA, finally continued to be symptomatic, and someone actually said, let me put you on an effective therapy that's actually approved. Funny enough. Anyway, so um, she had been placed on infliximab. Here's her dosing. But I think what's important and the purpose of really this discussion are her three statements, because I think it really sets the stage. So she's telling us that you may think I'm fine with all measures that you measure and tell me I'm in remission. I don't even know what that means. Your remission is not my remission. So what does she tell us? She says, I can't make it through a shift at work without using the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And two days ago, she was told she was in deep remission. So funny, right? So the same co conversations. I feel fatigue from having to wake up at night. And I used to love going out with my friends, but it really involves so much uncertainty. I do not know when I'm going to have an episode of urgency. How am I going to go out? How am I going to go on a date? How am I going to sit at a restaurant? I mean, I'm elaborating on Susie's thought process, but I think that's sort of the, the message. And I'm better off just staying in, right? So the isolation has set in. She's telling us what she needs. And it made sense. Her first colonoscopy um, had active inflammation. I could see you being tired, but she had ileal ulcerations, her rectum and her colon was actually completely normal. So again, this is what really changes the dialogue is our understanding. And then we walk out of the colonoscopy suite and we're like, great news, Susie, is you have complete mucosal healing. And she's like, yeah, but I don't go out. How, how pleasurable or how happy am I about this news that you just gave me? I think really understanding that. So um, we're going to just get one more audience um, response. And again, there's no right or wrong answer. And I think this is how we conceive and how we think about it. So this was just to sort of see how we all think around this topic. So what do we all believe is true regarding bowel urgency in patients with Crohn's specifically? Wonderful. And we'll come back again because we're just wanting to dig into um, sort of this conversation and think a little bit more about our preconceived ideas mm -hmm. of urgency. Um, and this here is just a framework really to just think about how would we think about in current times where we're understanding uh, that we need to think about urgency and both my friends here are going to walk through the elements but I think the slide is to say all right how do you measure it if you even do other than do you have it yes no which is pretty well how most of us were asking and continue to to this day but hopefully after today that's going to change um, and then do they have controlled or not controlled inflammation if the answer is they have controlled inflammation but they still report urgency that's where you come in, really, and you're going to help us through that. Versus no, I think all of us are easily say, all right, we just need to optimize your therapy. No, no brainer. Doesn't mean we're going to solve the urgency problem. So again, there's that disconnect. So Millie, why don't you go through and start to explain the impact of this symptom on Crohn's patients? Perfect, absolutely, and, and we actually have more and more data on this, and, and it's one of the reasons we wanted to bring this program to you to so you can see um, the most current data and hopefully apply some of this into your practice. But I think importantly, we're also gonna hear from McCall again, who's gonna tell us in her own words um, a little bit about this symptom impact. So when we think about the unmet needs in Crohn's disease, there obviously are a number. Um, we're not yet at uh, personalized therapy um, for each individual with Crohn's disease. We certainly need to do better with risk stratification with individualizing treatment for patients. We certainly have a therapeutic ceiling. Um, we're not yet at the therapy that will treat everyone um, with Crohn's disease. And sequencing is an area where we need further data. If you start on X, um, will you have less of a response to Y? How do we decide that sequencing now that we actually have more and more uh, novel therapeutics? We also need to better understand special populations, uh, whether that be young individuals or pregnant patients or patients with comorbidities. We certainly need improved monitoring strategies, uh, non-invasive strategies to help us to understand response at various time points. And uh, something very important for both us, our healthcare system, and our patients, what is the role of de-escalation? But what we'll be focusing on today is one of these other unmet needs, which is really restoring quality of life for our patients and how can we do better uh, in terms of that. And we're going to show some data uh, that actually was really eye-opening the first time that I saw some of these data. So um, when you look here, this was a study recently published in the American Journal of Gastroenterology that looked at the proportion of patients with Crohn's disease reporting um, bowel urgency. 
And when you look here, you can see it was actually stratified by TNF versus non-TNF, um, whether at enrollment, six months or 12 months. And rather than focusing on the stratification, I think I want to emphasize that regardless of the therapy they're on, you're seeing that urgency is persisting over the course of a year uh, for our patients. Uh, the worsening of bowel urgency symptoms um, certainly was there regardless um, of the treatment, whether six months to 12 months, we're not seeing benefit. So this is an area, it's an unmet need, where we can help to really improve um, the quality of life for our patients. So what are the symptoms with the most impact in our patients with Crohn's disease? Uh, really the big three are fatigue, pain, and bowel urgency. And unfortunately, we don't have great strategies specific to each of these outside of controlling the inflammation. But we're gonna try to give you a toolbox uh, for helping to manage the bowel urgency tonight. Certainly, these factors have multiple um, aggravators. They're, they can be relentless. They can be unpredictable. And often, that's what's hardest for our patients, just not knowing when that next shoe will drop um, in terms of uh, increasing symptoms. And really can have a far-reaching negative impact, whether that's in their mental health, their relationships, their work or school performance, or, or really social isolation and stigma. And the uncertainty and the requirement for constant planning and adaption adaptation really requires the patient to always be in a focus on their disease. And so we really want to improve this. And what do we mean by the symptoms our patients are having and the impact on their quality of life? I think that I really learned a lot from the CONFIDE survey, um, which actually was just published uh, last year. And when you look, whether in the US or in Europe, you can see that bowel urgency was among the top three most frequently reported Crohn's disease symptoms. Really? I, that's really just not something I would have thought in my practice. We, we, kind of, we really uh, associate Crohn's disease with pain, um, altered bowel frequency, but not necessarily urgency. But when you look here, we're looking at you know, three quarters of patients um, who are experiencing this. And so it's something that we really need to address. And, and that number is high even amongst those receiving advanced therapies. Uh, here, ever, a use of advanced therapy, you're still looking at over 50% of patients with bowel urgency. So when you look um, a little bit more specifically, you can see here how frequently, at least once per month, uh, over three quarters of patients uh, with bowel urgency, uh, almost two thirds of patients with bowel urgency related accidents. And this one was the one that kind of hit me, I think, the hardest. Um, and I know Marla and I have talked about this, but I don't routine, I didn't used to um, routinely ask my patients about this, but I've been surprised now that I've actually started that the majority of our patients actually require some sort of diaper or pad or, or protection associated with um, bowel urgency at least once per month. So that's really kind of groundbreaking to think that our patients are having to think about this and, and putting on protection to be able to leave the house. So this is just as much an issue in patients with Crohn's disease as it is in ulcerative colitis and we need to bring it into our discussions. So what are those discussions? I think Confide did a nice job of looking at what healthcare providers thought, uh, compare that um, to what um, patients thought. Um, and interestingly, um, healthcare providers were not very good about proactively discussing this um, with our patients. Um, and when, they, when we looked at reasons why, most of us felt that we expect the patient they should bring this up when you look over on the right side, or, or maybe we don't have enough time and there are other things, they may be a little bit uncomfortable, but it's really, well, this should be brought up by the patient. But what's the problem? The patients aren't bringing it up because of various factors, including embarrassment. I'll show you some of those numbers. But this is really, um, really common. And when we think about what we as healthcare providers are traditionally asking about, it's diarrhea, pain, and blood in stool. But that's not really what's bothering our patients. That's not really what's limiting their involvement in their lives um, and, and really limiting their quality of life. Uh, you know. I, I've actually had patients kind of chide me for this. When I, when I ask them about blood, they're like, well, that doesn't matter. You know, that, that's really not what they are most concerned about. So why are they not bringing this up? Actually, embarrassment was the most common reason. 73% um, of patients were not bringing this up, even though they had urgency, because they just didn't feel comfortable um, discussing this. And only 40% of US and 27% of European patients really actually felt completely comfortable bringing this up with their healthcare providers. So we need to circle this back to us, and this needs to be part of our inventory of what we're asking our patients. So what about daily activity? How does IBD impact that? Almost 80% of patients report that it limits their physical activity. A third 
really avoid running or jogging. And what are those reasons? There's some fatigue in there, um, a concern about disease flare-ups, but again, 61% were concerned about going and exercising and having increased toilet urgency. And this is a problem. Exercise impacts mental health. Exercise, in fact, we've done a study in our IBD partners cohort that exercise is actually protective of relapse, like if you can actually have a patient exercise. And so this really uh, impacts our patients. What are the reasons for avoiding? This was uh, a nice survey that looked at everything from joint pain, abdominal pain, disease flare-up, but really lack of toilet access is really in there, um, you can see. And, and embarrassment, these factors where they don't want to participate in aspects of life. So how do they adapt? Um, you can see here that um, many patients actually avoid, this is what they avoided. And really running and jogging is at the top of that list. And so patients are avoiding that lack of access to toilets. Sexual health, another topic that we're not very good at uh, as healthcare providers about bringing up um, with our patients. But sexual functioning, functioning satisfaction, and sexual drive can really be negatively impact by, impacted by inflammatory bowel disease and can impact a patient's quality of life. So this was a survey of almost 500 gastroenterologists, 70% never or rarely asked about sexual dysfunction. 75% did not change treatment uh, if a patient reported sexual dysfunction. And what were the barriers? Um, lack of knowledge was the primary one. Lack of experience, lack of time, and even embarrassment. Um, so really providing us with resources to be able to address this and have support for our patients uh, becomes very important. And what is one thing we could do um, we could address urgency um, because urgency has a huge impact on uh, sexual activity. Um, when you look at the top row, um, pro patient provided reasons for avoiding or decreasing sexual activity, urgency is at the top. And so this is one way we can help our patients um, with concerns about um, uh, sexual activity and sexual dysfunction. When you look at patients who avoided or decreased sexual activity in the last three months, it's really over half of our patients. Um, and so this is impacting um, uh, every other patient that we're seeing in clinic. This next study was a study that um, we did in our IBD Partners cohort. So IBD Partners is an internet-based registry of patients really living all over the world um, with inflammatory bowel disease, whether that be Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. And the music study looked at characteristics uh, of patients with and without um, bowel urgency and looked at uh, associations um, here and there, and I'll show you some associations with other quality of life factors next. But essentially, um, in this population of um, really uh, almost 2,000 patients with Crohn's disease, you'll see that um, prior surgery, prior hospitalization, and certainly remission was associated with bowel urgency. In fact, in the overall cohort, over half of patients with Crohn's disease, this huge number of patients with Crohn's disease, actually reported bowel urgency. And not surprisingly, um, bowel urgency was higher among patients with active disease as compared to those in remission. But I want you to remember these numbers. 87% of those with active disease, but still 48% of patients in remission in this very large cohort actually had bowel urgency. So again, that unmet need. When we looked to try to correlate this with other factors, you'll see on the left, um, bowel urgency was associated with worsened social satisfaction, more fatigue, sleep disturbance, just as our patient uh, in the example scenario um, is having, pain interference, anxiety, depression. So all of these different um, promise measures um, that are uh, linked and have been validated for these PROs. Even when you look on the right-hand side, these are the group of patients who are actually in remission. And even in remission, bowel urgency is associated with um, each of these factors. So again, an unmet need for us to address. And next, I'd like to hear a little bit about this in McCall's own words um, so that we can take some of uh, her points home. Whenever I was originally diagnosed, when I knew I could no longer take care of myself, I truly was going probably every 45 minutes. Like if that, I would go to class and on my way back home, I would have to stop in the library bathroom because I have literally marked down every bathroom <laughs> from Oklahoma City where my family lives to Norman. I know all the good bathrooms to stop at on campus. I had to teach myself that in order to um, avoid having an accident in public, which seemed so scary at the time and now it like now I avoid it but at the time it was fairly normal 
um like in the beginning I was in the show outside of OU I was in this show and it got to the point where being in the rehearsal of this show was the only thing that could take my mind off of how sick I was feeling but along with that came the fact that I was literally 20 years old in the production of this show and I like had to wear diapers under my costume and that's like something you never would think about and no one around me knew that but the fact that I knew that and I knew that like at 20 years old I had to go through this this was pre-colon removal it was just like it was really really challenging and I've had moments like that post like after my reversal when I was just like really really feeling sick and I was like I cannot do this I have I have to sleep in a diaper tonight I don't know what I'm gonna do and that's like that's a really challenging um and it really has an impact. And I think I've been able to look at it more positively. Um, but I think for the vast majority of people, that can be really terrifying. It's terrifying to, to hear the impact on McCall. Yeah. So um, we've had a few nice comments that I want to shout out that people are very, um, really grateful that we're having this conversation. Um, and seeing her story probably is the most important part of this because I think it, it makes it all real for us. Um, and it's really these college students, and we all, you particularly have college have students. college student patients. Um, and that I tend to, again, have these dialogues that I'm in a dorm, mm -hmm. there's one bathroom, I have to, I need to wear a diaper. Yeah. And it wasn't until sometimes because we may not have asked, it's when we go to do the examination, they're in our office, and I'm like, are you wearing, you know, a diaper? Mm -hmm. And she says, that's the only way I could stay in class or I could stay in my dorm. Mm -hmm. I need to be at school. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I had a patient tell me once, you know, we, we, she has Crohn's disease, and her bowel had healed, and we were talking about being in remission, and she's like, I don't know what remission means. And I kind of, she, she told me that, you know, I still, when my friends, we, there's a lake near campus in, at, in Chapel Hill, and my friends go out to the lake on the weekend, and I don't feel comfortable going on a boat because I can't wear protection. I may have urgency. And it just floored me because her scope looked good, but we still had to fix this. And so when she finally got on the boat on the weekends, that's when we knew uh, she was in remission, and it was from really addressing her urgency. So... Um how do we bring the conversation to make patients? You said that she was most of the time is because of embarrassment, you know, plus yeah. half the time, you know, our hands on the doorknob waiting already because we had 15 minutes and we know we have five patients yeah. waiting. And so how do you have this empathetic conversation when you know that they're waiting for us to bring it up? They think it's too, it's you know, patients feel it's embarrassing and they don't want to be the only one. There's a lot that goes into that. So since you've been involved in these mm -hmm. conversations, have you proactively asked that in your epic drop down? Well, so, well, it'd probably be smart if I actually did a pre-survey and got <laughs> at this information, but instead, um, what I do is I just try to normalize it. You know, often I, you know, you do your chatting, you say hello, and then you say, well, how are you? You know, they usually say fine, they're college students. And, and then you kind of dig in and you say, well, you know, I'm gonna run through a list of normal symptoms you know, associated with inflammatory bowel disease and I'm asking everyone, I wanna know if you have any of this. You know, what's your bowel frequency? Are you having blood? Are you having pain? Are you having urgency? We just need to start doing it. And even before, there are some wonderful tools that you're gonna teach us about and I think implementing those is the gold standard, but us bringing this up, I think is step one. Yeah. So how did you approach McCall? Yeah, no, I think, uh, patients like McCall and some of our other patients are our best teachers. I think mm -hmm. we can learn a lot from our textbooks and guidelines, but when we see these patients every day, uh, we learn a lot from them. And McCall has taught us a lot, and not only her, but patients like her. Um, and I think one of the critical things that you were asking about how you incorporate in your 15-minute, 10-minute follow-up visits um, it's also educating your staff because many of us have scribes, MAs, rumors who room the patients, and if if sometimes they can be a great help. And mm -hmm. and we McCall and there was another patient about ten years ago that really really touched us because um, it's a very sad story, and I'll just very briefly tell you 
a 19 year old um, with um, increased symptoms come to us. We took care of him and he got better and he came to us and he was so happy with his mom that I'm getting a job at Sam's Club and I'm gonna start tomorrow. And I'm so happy and I'm very thankful that you started me on this advanced therapy. Three weeks later, we heard that he passed away. He committed suicide and uh, we were just shocked. Found out that it was his first day at Sam's Club. He was a cashier and he just had an accident and he just could not take it. He just could not take it. Um, so we went back, we were just discussing and kind of like self-learned ourselves that how important these symptoms are and sometimes we just tend to ignore. Oh, okay, well, we'll address this. Well, we're more focused on your calprotectin. We need to be getting your colonoscopy set up and we'll talk about it once we get more tests done without realizing that that's what their immediate needs are. So I think these patients have really taught us um, about addressing the issues that probably we were not addressing, especially urgency in Crohn's disease. So I think, and then I think the ch big challenge right now, and I think you're gonna teach us today, is how do you assess bowel urgency? Mm -hmm. Because everyone has their own definition of bowel urgency also. So I think we're gonna learn that also today about how do you ask and frame that question and get that information out of the patient. I mean, also, Millie, thank you. Um, Millie, you noted that you're just asking. So do you have to wear any diapers or protective yeah. garments um, during, during the day, yeah. at night? Ask it. It, yeah. it needs to be normalized. And I think Millie and I had a, um, a meeting we were at, and it was all about, there was a, a conversation around sexual health, and both of us were like, as female physicians especially, it's shameful that we are not uh, approaching this like we ask about all other aspects. Right. And you showed, and bowel urgency. So the next question. Highly linked, yeah. <laughs> highly next linked. question yeah. is, so right. how is this affecting your, you know, your sexual, are you, your intimate relationships? Are you in a relationship? Um, have you avoided a relationship because of concerns about intimacy mm -hmm. and um, the impact of bowel urgency? Uh, and it was funny, you know, when you showed that abstract of TNF versus um, not. Neither one got better. Yeah. And no one gets better, but also it reminds me, I remember that presentation where people were in complete deep remission and their fatigue continued, right? right. So we were looking at these symptoms in isolation saying um, we always thought that depression, anxiety, urgency, fatigue, the magic of our advanced therapies are just going to like you know, get rid of all of those symptoms that are due to having active inflammation. Boy, were we completely off. And so, you know, there was a lot of questions around um, sort of how do you bring it up, which we, which we talked about. Um, and one of the questions is, in someone who's in even histo healing, we'll get to that yes. because you're gonna tell, yeah. talk yes. to oh, so he's us. He's gonna teach us a lot. Yeah. It'll be great. Um, and one question is that, do you know if there's um, similar prevalence between UC and CD for urgency? Um, are we aware of sort of what's out there in terms of prevalence? Yeah, absolutely. So our music study, um, we actually did a UC cohort as well. And the numbers are comparable, but believe it or not, slightly higher in Crohn's disease. Which again, totally counter to everything we learned in our textbooks in med school, by the way. So um, we just weren't asking the right questions right. and we weren't understanding. So we're gonna just do one um, uh, audience response um, question here and then move in and hopefully answer, answer it with some of the information, the data that we have. So which of the following assess assessments captures bowel urgency impact in patients with Crohn's disease? So we'll get back to that because I think it'll become pretty clear um, what we've been doing um, until 2023 yeah. has had absolutely zero ability to capture what we need to capture, yeah. which is yeah. kind of bananas. But anyways, all right, so this was interesting. So as part of um, some initiatives with some of the members of the International Organization of Inflammatory Bowel Disease and others, as we start to move into creating a framework to actually capture this very impactful and burdensome symptom, they look back to see across all clinical trials how urgency was defined and whether there was a uh, standardized way of measuring urgency. And the good news is that the majority, 20 of whatever, the 28, never defined it and weren't even asking about it. So I mean, that sort of, I think, was the drop the mic moment to know that, well, 
This is not where we want to, right. we don't want to repeat bad history, but you can see across the board, some defined it as asking them if they didn't make it in time, um, some that they couldn't defer for more than 15 minutes. Uh, who knows why 15 minutes determines whether it's urgent or not, it's arbitrary, uh, maybe five minutes, uh, and also just, do you have an urgency to go to the bathroom? Again, undefined, what does that even mean? And I would even venture to tell you that none of them measured the severity. And that's really the key distinguishing characteristic of the uh, urgency in RS, but it was really about how severe was your urgency. And I think the measure, and even you know, with some of our trials and in our clinic, as noted, it's a yes, no answer, mm -hmm. um, which doesn't really answer the question that we really want to solve for, which is how, how severe and how does it impact your daily living? And we've got some really cool um, qualitative type research that is also continuing um, to look at um, how we're describing the impact on the on their daily lives. So the barriers to identified bowel urgency in Crohn's disease in particular is does normal stool frequency mean no bowel urgency? We've always made that connection, that um, stool frequency, but I always tell my patients and listen and validate that we, that this is like terrible. Like really validate that what they're feeling is just awful, you know, and what they're experiencing. And you know patients would say to you, and they've told us all, I'd rather have five controlled bowel movements that I can make it to the bathroom than one bowel movement that resulted in an accident. Yeah. Just one. You just need one as right. an IBD patient to forever change your life. Mm -hmm. And unwinding or, you know, moving beyond that without understanding the impact of that event on someone's life is really critical for us to make that uh, connectivity. And here is just the effect that most, pa many patients, the majority here is slightly more than, the, than half, um, have no change in stool frequency, which again gets to the fact that we're asking about stool frequency in our PROs for clinical trials. That's what we're asking is stool frequency, rectal bleeding, you see stool frequency in abdominal pain and Crohn's. Never does it say about urgency right. again. Um, and so uh, we talked about it in the question, there was specifically other things. And right now, just remember, what I'm showing you here are the currently used, at least three out of the four, the Harvey Bradshaw is not typically integrated into clinical trials. But for Crohn's disease, the Crohn's disease activity index for clinical response, clinical remission, the IBDQ for purposely health-related quality of life, validated measure, questions that get to some fatigue and some urgency, double-barrel questions, really not asking about severity, and of course, PRO2, which is, again, stool frequency and abdominal pain. That's it. So the currently, those that were up until really Truth be told, until miracizumab right. uh, for Crohn's disease, there has never the validated and what's thought to be regulatory based uh, indices to judge whether treatments actually get approval and meet the endpoints that are predefined. Um, they didn't ask a patient whether this is what actually they want their drug to be approved for. But again, moving beyond that, you could tell like I'm I'm crazy about this story. So anyway, so. None of them actually capture bowel urgency severity. That was sort of the concept. But what finally came into play, which again was really introduced in UC first, and what we learned about the urgency numeric rating scale, and this is a 11 point scale, which asks, asks specifically about the severity of the urgency and a score of zero to 10, 10 being obviously worst possible. It is asked the severity in the last 24 hours. How it's calculated, I'm gonna show you some data in the clinical trials, uh, was really looking at a weekly average score over the previous seven days when we're asking them to go back and at the study endpoints and look back over the last seven days. And the higher score obviously indicates, as noted, um, worse bowel urgency. So again, just noting this is against a binary yes, no scale. And that's what I think is really the, to me, that was the evolution of understanding urgency. So setting the stage, so we all know the answer to that question obviously was that none of them really uh, focused on severity until the urgency NRS. So 
why and the fact that every single organization got latest guidelines really tells us that we need to be asking about urgency, but it took up until a more recent clinical trial to really tell us that we can measure it and we can successfully show change, right? So the other part of the story is incontinence. I mean, that has not been studied and we haven't you know, validated a measure, mm -hmm. but I think when you showed the impact on quality of life and I had made a, made a point that just one episode of incontinence really sets the stage for your journey. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I asked that bef in general and usual, I say in my drop down, um, after asking about urgency, yes, no, until mm -hmm. more recent, then I would say, if you have an, ac an accident or episode right. of incontinence, but I definitely wasn't following that up with, do you wear a diaper at least once a week to right. work? Um, and in New York, because there's you know subways, for example, we have not an insignificant amount of patients that are actually unable to go and get to work and don't use public transportation. And because they don't have a bathroom or access, so there are. So um, when I asked Lori and was told her that I'm so like Lori Kiefer, who's like genius PhD health psychologist, and I said I can't believe that I've never, asked, you know, I was like again psychotic about my lack of attentiveness to patients, burden, symptoms. She goes, Yeah, but that's what they tell me. I said, Why don't they ever tell me that? She's like, Well, that's what they tell me every day. People are using diapers to go on the MTA. You know, are, this is just how their life is. And they didn't think they, you could do anything about it. And so I ask probing questions and get into how they're actually living their best life, yes or no. Do you feel in control of your disease? That's when I get the information because this tells me they feel they don't have control over their life, right? They don't have control over their, their bowel. We're, we love to see that there's actually FDA guidance on the fact in Crohn's that we should be looking at it. Here is, you know, again, some guidance on, and there is other PROs that we know. There's a 6, C, uh, 6 CD score, uh, as well as a CDPRO SS, which really uh, Peter Higgins has been mm -hmm. a strong advocate for in driving that forward. But again, the real one that really speaks to sort of the concept of measuring it in a validated manner, manner as noted. This is again just showing you the NRS as a sort of as we think about it in the scale over 24 hours. And we're doing some work to show that even in the last 24 hours could really be that on its own, not in the trial where we had seven days and looked at the severity and the average. But even just asking in the last 24 hours, that's probably just enough to actually move us in the direction of making a change. What I do want to highlight is as part of the the psychometric evaluation as we were working through and looking at the data, you could see um, this was uh, participants that registered full range of weekly uh, average UR UNRS from zero to 10 showing you at week zero and at week 12. You wanna make sure that this scale is responsive to change. That when you actually do an intervention that you can measure that there's a meaningful change um, and that it responds. Any type of PRO, any type of biomarker, it has to be responsive. You have to be able to measure it and you have to be able to see uh, impact. And so it was really shown that that weekly work, that that weekly data was really able to summarize the UN, UNRS across a range. And what I'd like to show you, and the good news is, at baseline, before intervention, the light blue was in the higher scores. And the good news is, is that after you gave an intervention at 12 weeks, you had the darker blue being towards zero, one, two. So you saw that there was a change, right? An important, meaningful change right. to say that this therapy actually made a difference. And a lot of people will ask um, us when we're talking about this topic, well, what's a meaningful change? I mean, does going from 10 to nine mean much? Actually, we were pretty surprised at some of the data that even a one point change is actually something a patient values. So it's it was, again, a very uh, eye-opening experience to sort of work on reading some of the qualitative data uh, on what's changed. But in general, if you wanted to look at it, it looked like at least a three-point change was probably the most meaningful for patients and applicable to how you and I would maybe use this mm -hmm. in clinical practice. So at the end of the day, 
Um, we all know, and Millie have sort of made a case around why urgency matters, but I think the only voice that really was um, necessary and impactful was hearing from the patient themselves. I don't, we could show data till the cows come right. home, but unless you hear it directly from a patient, and I hope that all of you were shook sort of when she said, as you know, how she needed to wear her, her um, diaper really to sort of live her life and get to school and not miss class and had to find a bathroom and map them out from Oklahoma City to Norman. You know, just these are things that stick with us. So I think, you know, understanding that we're moving away from do you have urgency and that is just the start of the conversation and right. then how severe it is how much it impacts your your daily life are you engaging in intimate relationships etc more so than um, sort of trying to figure out but this is not possible your rectum is not involved why are you having urgency I got a lot of questions around like what's the Pathophysiology. Oh, we're going to hear about that. We're going to yeah. hear about it. So <laughs> the best part is is you now. Okay. Um, okay. So we're going to move to you, and um, you're going to walk us through and walk us yeah. through also some treatment planning. Yeah, I think that's kind of like a little bit daunting task also because we're learning the burden of urgency. We are learning uh, how critical it is to incorporate the assessment of urgency very recently now. So how do we package it together and bring it to our clinical practice and what can we do in our practice and how we can manage it? I'll, I'll share some of the suggestions and proposals that uh, we put it together, uh, but I think there's a lot of work that needed to be done so that we can bring this to our guidelines and, and make a better strategy to manage fecal urgency uh, in our patients. So one last um, video of McCall that we're gonna share here. When I think about success with bowel urgency, I think it's very different for every person. The same with how Crohn's and colitis and, and like everything is very different with every patient. For me in particular, because my so much of my world has to do with acting in theater, um, that's how I was kind of measuring my success in things was that there were times like I stated before where I was in a show and I literally couldn't get through the 50, the show was 50 minutes long and I couldn't get through the duration of the 50 minutes without having to go to the bathroom. And sometimes I could, um, but the fact that I didn't know that if I could even make it 50 minutes, um, meant that I had to wear a diaper during the production. And for my senior year of college, I was in a production both in the fall and in the spring. And in the fall production, I did the entire hour and a half with no diaper. I got through it just fine. And that was an incredible success for me. And then in the spring semester, I had to wear a corset in the show, which was hard enough before. And now it was really testing me. And I was also able to get through the entire production of the show, which was incredible. And it was able to give me pretty clear markers of knowing that I had started to figure things out, that my biologics were starting to work. And it had to do with also what I ate and when I ate. And that was a challenge, like knowing that if I had to it eat, I couldn't eat directly before the production of show or I would have to go to the bathroom. So I had to make sure I ate two hours before the production. So I had time to digest the food for a little bit because I still wanted to like, you know, work myself up and not have to go to the bathroom immediately. So I would want to give myself that time. And then I would have to go to the bathroom directly before the show. So then I didn't have to go anytime after, which is still hard because then you're sharing a dressing room with a bunch of people and then you have to go to the bathroom. So I would have to go upstairs and find the hidden bathroom so I could go to the bathroom with no one noticing and get back down in time to start the production of the show, which was a challenge every time, but it started to become um, easier and more manageable. And I was able to still be aware of a schedule and I had to find my new normal, um, which was tricky, but also I've definitely started to navigate that more. Whereas now it's <laughs> kind of become you know, a joke with among me and my friends and my boyfriend and my family, where if I can make it like three hours after a meal without going to the bathroom, we just celebrate. So I think we hear these success stories from other patients also. Uh, what are their goals? What do they actually want um, out of the treatment? And that reminded me of another patient um, who, after a very successful treatment, comes to our clinic and she's just laughing and giggling and and I ask her, like, okay, I, I got it that you're better, but 
why are you so happy? What's, tell me, like, what's, what did you achieve that made you so happy and you're just giggling? Um, and she said that, you know, my kids, she had a three-year-old and a six-year-old. She said, my kid thought that bathroom is mama's room. And this is the first time I could live with my kids, read the story at night, sleep with them. And, and that, that was a huge impact for her because she, her kids thought that mama's room is the bathroom. So, so stories like this really reminds you about revisiting treatment targets. What are you trying to achieve here uh, with your patients? And similarly, as we have been discussing Susie's case here, who have been impacted by urgency, um, and it's impacting her work. As you can see here, it's impacting her quality of life. She's fatigued. Uh, and then the last thing that we also uh, learned about Susie is that she's almost at the verge of social isolation here. So it's really negatively impacting the social behavior of uh, our patients. So if you ask Susie, she wants to have um, a work shift without interruption. She wants to have less uh, bowel movements or um, going to the restroom at nighttime. And, and she wants to enjoy life. She wants to socialize. These are her uh, treatment goals. And patients like McCall and Susie, they're not far-fetched from what rest of the patients want. And actually, this is a study that I'm sharing with you. It's a study by our uh, colleagues from Barcelona. And what they did was, this was an observational study, and they asked the patient, what's the most important treatment targets? And uh, you can see that 40% of the patients wanted their quality of life to be improved and 33% of the patients wanted complete resolution of the symptoms. And pain and urgency being the two most important symptoms in Crohn's disease, they wanted to be having a complete resolution, as opposed to only 13% of the patients who wanted their colonoscopy to be normal. And, and if, you, if, you, if you remind ourselves, I mean, we are all about mucosal healing, normalization, endoscopic improvement, but that's true, but we, we need to realize that um, there are other aspects um, in IBD that we need to um, address to these patients. So how do we package this all together? As we started our discussion about uh, number one, um, assessing the bowel urgency. Um, and there are different tools, and we learned today about the urgency numerical rating scale uh, to assess uh, accurately not only the presence of urgency, but also the severity of urgency. And then the second thing we probably need to assess is the inflammation. Is the inflammation present or the urgency symptoms are without inflammation? If the inflammation is present and it's not controlled, um, we all know that we need to optimize therapy. We may need to initiate more effective therapy to those patients. But what about those patients who have no inflammation or no signs of inflammation? Their calprotectin is normal. Their endoscopy is normal. Just like Miss Susie we were discussing today who had a normal appearing um, endoscopy, uh, but yet she is suffering from all these symptoms. So that's where the role of other um, non-inflammatory pharmacological and non-pharmacological interventions play a role. Uh, there is a role for dietary modifications. Uh, we'll learn about how low FODMAP diet uh, can play a role here. Uh, certain medications, such as antidiarrheal medications, uh, bile acid sequestrants, tricyclic antidepressants, and perhaps even a, um, a role of pancreatic enzymes that we will share some data on that. Um, Anorectal dysfunction is also very common, and we need to address that. We need to investigate that and then manage it through biofeedback therapy or pelvic floor uh, physical therapy. We'll touch uh, base on that also. And lastly, the psychosocial support. That's critical. Um, we all need um, experts like Lori Kiefer in all our practices. Uh, mental health is extremely, extremely important uh, when we are addressing our patients and improving their quality of life. Uh, so psychotherapy, the, giving them tools uh, to, to develop strategies to cope with these uh, stressors uh, is, are critical in the management of these patients. So let's start with the dietary modification or dietary intervention. So you have a patient who is complaining of bowel urgency and stool frequency, has no inflammation like our patient Susie. Um, so limiting their highly fermentable um, 
oligosaccharides, di it's so hard to pronounce, uh, oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols, or FODMAPs. Uh, it can really, uh, these high FODMAPs have been shown to have various physiological effects on the gut, and they can produce a lot of symptoms, including bowel urgency, bloating, and diarrhea also. So limiting your FODMAPs can have a positive impact. And in fact, there is a study, uh, uh, this is a study from UK, and uh, in this study, uh, a single-blinded study, all patients who had quiescent IBD, but they had ongoing gut symptoms. Um, and about 52 of these patients were enrolled in this study, and all were given either a four-week course of low FODMAP diet or sham dietary advice. And as you can see in the results here, uh, that their IBS symptom severity scale did not change, but the gut symptoms really improved. And you can see that there's a significant difference in patients who were given four week of low FODMAP trial versus uh, sham dietary advice. So it really helped improve their symptoms. Uh, the same group uh, from UK actually did another study. It was another um, double blind crossover study where um, a very interesting design. So these are the patients who were in remission or had quiescent IBD, and they were having functional gastrointestinal symptoms. And they were given low FODMAP diet for at least two weeks. And those who responded were then challenged with FODMAPs. And not only challenged with FODMAPs, they were challenged with different um, fermentable carbohydrates. As you can see here, fructans and galacto-oligosaccharides and sorbitol and glucose and in a random fashion. And you can see here that it's the fructan in the FODMAP that is driving those symptoms, including bowel urgency, more compared to the other. So perhaps something to consider that if your patients cannot do low FODMAP diet or has done low FODMAP diet and they want to reintroduce food, perhaps cut down or minimize the fructans component of those fermentable carbohydrates to see if they can, uh, it can help with their urgency. Um, when it comes to the pharmacotherapy, uh, besides the dietary intervention, let's talk about pharmacotherapy now. So antidiarials, uh, such as loperamide, has been shown to improve bowel urgency uh, that is caused by both inflammatory and non-inflammatory mechanisms. Loperamide can uh, normalize your colon transit time, and it's thought to increase the internal anal sphincter tone also. And actually, there are studies that have shown that loperamide decreases several gastrointestinal um, functional symptoms, such as fecal urgency, frequency, and it can also improve stool consistency. And this is a very interesting and intriguing study, a very old study published in 95. Uh, in patients with Crohn's disease, um, and the group actually uh, administered two milligram of loperamide as a loading dose, and then for one week, these patients were given one milligram of loperamide oxide after each unformed bowel uh, stool, and they were followed for one week. And after one week, those who responded were then given one milligram of loperamide oxide twice daily for another one week. And what the group discovered that after one week of taking loperamide, um, both the investigators and the patient's evaluation for global efficacy were in favor of loperamide. And patient reported severity of diarrhea also improved with loperamide. Also, it helped with abdominal pain. After second week, where they were given one milligram of loperamide oxide twice daily, um, although uh, it did not reach uh, statistical significance, both investigators and patients' assessment of global efficacy and symptom improvement, including urgency, continued to be in favor of loperamide. So very interesting study uh, showing the impact of a very simple over-the-counter medication that can help in these patients. What about the role of tricyclic antidepressants? We have learned a lot about uh, tricyclic antidepressants, um, especially amitriptyline in our IBS patients for pain and diarrhea. Um, and this is a study that is, I think, again, from UK, the group of, uh, it was a study done by the surgeons um, for idiopathic fecal incontinence. Um, about 44% of these patients who had fecal incontinence were also reporting urgency. And these patients were given amitriptyline, 20 milligram, for four weeks. Um, just recall that um, 
in the United States, uh, we have the different doses of amitriptyline, and it does not have an FDA approval to be used for fecal urgency. But in this study, when they were given 20 milligram of amitriptyline for four weeks, and after four weeks, patients were evaluated for fecal incontinence scores, a number of bowel movements, uh, and some other anorectal uh, manometric uh, uh, measurements. And what they witnessed that after four weeks of getting amitriptyline, 20 milligram, there was improvement in the scores for incontinence as well as bowel frequency. And not only that, if you look at uh, some more details, and especially the last box, you will see that their rectal motor complexes, uh, their median number of these mo rectal motor complexes actually reduced. Uh, their median anal pressure um, improved and the rectal pressure uh, decreased. So actually improving the rectal compliance and increasing the anal pressure. So again, uh, there is a potential role for tricyclic antidepressants such as amitriptyline uh, in these patients who are suffering from urgency or fecal incontinence. Then ab what about bile acids? Uh, there's another um, uh, physiologic changes that can happen in our, or pathologic changes that can happen in our IBD patients where we can get um, bile acid malabsorption. Bile acid malabsorption can happen for many reasons in our IBD patients. It could be because of the small bowel surgery, resection, inflammation, and even the dysbiosis uh, in your colon can yield to an altered bile acid pool where in a normal bile acid pool, you see a lot of secondary bile acids, but if it is abnormal due to many reasons, including uh, disturbed or disrupted enterohepatic um, uh, cycle of bile acid metabolism, uh, you get a lot of primary bile acids, and they can lead you to have more frequency, urgency, uh, and more symptoms. And in fact, uh, one of the tests that uh, can be done to check for bile acid malabsorption is uh, CCAT, not very widely used in clinical practices, but this study actually showed that 90% of the patients who had bowel resection in Crohn's disease, uh, and majority of these patients had ileocecal resection, 90% of these patients had uh, bile acid malabsorption. And even in the absence of bowel resection, 30%, almost 30% of these patients had bile acid malabsorption for other reasons. So bile acid malabsorption is something that we may need to keep in mind when we are assessing urgency in patients like Miss Susie, who's, um, who is in remission uh, when it comes to inflammation, but is still suffering from uh, symptoms like urgency. What about pancreatic enzymes? Um, so exocrine pancreatic insufficiency um, has been shown to be present in patients with IBD. Uh, studies have shown that uh, reduced fecal elastase can be present in about 18% of our patients with IBD, and there are many reasons why they can have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. Um, very rarely our IBD patients can have pancreatic problems also. Um, but in the absence of pancreatic pathology, they can still have EPI as measured by uh, fecal elastase. But we do need to remind ourselves about the false positive right. fecal elastase that can happen because of the watery diarrhea that can dilute the elastase also. However, uh, this is something that you may need to keep in mind and investigate. Um, and in fact, uh, the 2023 AGA clinical practice update on EPI does recommend that EPI should be considered in patients yeah. with moderate risk clinical conditions such as Crohn's disease and uh, fecal elastase tests can be done. And if it is truly EPI um, and the test is positive, then uh, consider uh, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy in those patients. So lastly, I will touch base on anorectal dysfunction. Um, we learned about the anorectal dysfunction that can be caused by the inflammation, by proctitis, um, and other causes such as we learned about bile acid malabsorption and IBS and bacterial overgrowth, uh, but poor rectal compliance, uh, neurological causes of anorectal dysfunction, and anal sphincter dysfunction can also contribute to your anorectal dysfunction also. 
So this was a nice study. Um, I think this is a study from Greece and a uh, very interesting study uh, giving us the concept of how does that, how it can happen. So these were the patients, 41 patients with Crohn's disease. And these patients had, uh, out of these group, um, they, they studied the group with no endoscopic um, inflammation, evidence of inflammation, but the biopsy proven Crohn's disease. So negative endoscopy and positive histology. So they got 20 patients out of this pool of Crohn's disease patients who have negative endoscopy or normal endoscopy, but on histology there was um, inflammation. And what they discovered that in these patients who were in endoscopic remission but histologically they were still positive um, compared to the patients who had negative rectal pathology, uh, like completely normal rectal pathology, uh, completely normal rectum histologically. These patients who had evidence of histologically positive inflammation in a normal appearing rectum. They had lower anal resting and squeeze pressure. They had lower sphincter and high pressure um, zone length. The rectal sensation was affected. And some other anorectal manometry findings such as ultra so slow wave amplitude and ultra so slow wave frequency, both were sl uh, also lower in these patients. And rectal compliance was also reduced. So the study showed us that despite normal appearing rectum, since there was some presence of inflammation at the histologic level, it was uh, affecting the rectal compliance. It was contributing to the anorectal dysfunction or dyssynergic defecation in these patients. And that is then exacerbated in the patients who now have active inflammation. So what do we do with these patients? So one thing for patients who have anorectal dysfunction, we can consider biofeedback therapy. So biofeedback is actually a self-regulation technique uh, that we can teach to our patients um, to strengthen their pelvic floor muscles, uh, to retain their rectal sensation, and coordinate pelvic floor muscles during evacuation. It typically consists of three phases. Uh, in phase one, you assess. You educate patients about the findings of anorectal manometry and explaining to them that what's wrong and what could be contributing to their urgency. Uh, phase two that entails um, active exercise and training phase where not only you, strength, you perform strengthening training to improve the external anal sphincter, you also improve the rectal sensory training and you also do the coordinator coordination training to help coordinate and increase the threshold for urgency also. And then the last phase is where uh, you can wean off these uh, biofeedback trainings and then reinforcement according to the individualized need for that patient. So biofeedback is also something that we can consider in our patients where we have ruled out that there is uh, no bile acid malabsorption, EPI, and they have uh, anorectal manometry showing that there is a anorectal dysfunction. And anorectal dysfunction is actually prevalent in our IBD patients. Um, this this dyssynergic defecation is present in our patients, um, not only in patients who have had colectomy and J-pouch, but also in patients who are without surgery. So even in a, in a patient without uh, any surgical intervention, you can see that uh, anorectal dysfunction or dyssynergic defecation is present uh, in as high as 97% of these patients. And with patients who had J-pouch, it's also very commonly uh, present. And then there is a response to these biofeedback therapy. And that response is quite um, uh, impressive. 70 to 80% of these patients do respond to these biofeedback therapy. Pelvic floor training, um, pelvic floor training with or without biofeedback uh, can also help with incontinence and urgency in patients with quiescent IBD. Uh, when we perform pelvic muscle contraction, um, so the pelvic muscle contraction strength, um, it uh, can be diminished um, in shortened, tight, and tense muscles. And that can happen in an inflammatory condition and also when your muscles are weak, uh, when you have pelvic floor muscle weakness. And that both can then affect the continence and the ability to evacuate. 
and patients who have gone these treatments have shown improvement in their symptom score, quality of life, and illness perception also. So lastly, um, uh, it's a few other words about uh, pelvic floor muscle training. Uh, it's just not a training where you're just strengthening the muscles. So it's not just uh, Kegel exercises. Actually, in pelvic floor muscle training, it also incorporates exercises that improve patients' awareness of muscle contraction and relaxation. And it also helps them coordinate the abdominal diaphragm muscles uh, for the normal function of continence and effective defecation. So in short, um, all these behavior treatment uh, are tailored to an individualized patient symptoms, and it can include pelvic floor muscle training with and without feedback, biofeedback. It can also include some other behavioral treatments such as toileting modification, urge resistance, lifestyle changes, and more importantly, um, emotional support. And lastly, I think this is my last uh, slide, on uh, kind of like consolidating everything, what I just explained, that uh, the important and critical thing is recognizing this, um, recognizing the presence and the impact of fecal urgency in our patients, uh, explicit and empathetic inquiry of patients about urgency and how we can register this in, in our clinical notes and in our, um, in our daily practices, and then providing them with emotional support, with social support, um, performing appropriate diagnostic investigations, um, offering them medical therapy, uh, physical therapy, biofeedback therapy, and some other complementary therapy that can really help them improve their fecal urgency. So going back to Ms. Um, Susie, who had these three treatment goals. Number one, how she can work. Uh, same as we learned from McCall also, that she wanted to finish her shift or, or, or sh her um, practice um, and also improvement the fatigue because of this nighttime awakenings. And the third goal of Miss Susie, that was um, social, uh, preventing social isolation. So what we can offer to Miss Susie, we have already taken care of her inflammation, we have already optimized her therapy. The other things, uh, just to summarize what we just discussed, uh, Miss Susie can be offered anorectal manometry testing to see if there's any anorectal uh, dysfunction or uh, dyssynergic defecation. Uh, we can evaluate her for bile acid malabsorption. We can, get, uh, we can discuss with her a trial of amitriptyline uh, a low-dose amitriptyline. We can discuss about dietary modification. Uh, we can also assess her for depression and anxiety, and also a trial of loperamide that can also be considered uh, in her case when we are managing patients' urgency like Ms. Susie. So that's where I'm gonna end. Uh, it was a little bit uh, to digest, but I think this was all we have learned, have practiced, is just how do we put it together for our patients who are suffering from urgency. Well, thank you. You've actually got generated the most. We have almost 50 questions that have come oh in God. just from our <laughs> discussions today. Um, many of them were complimenting the fact that this did not show any clinical trial data, did not talk about a drug name per se. This was focused on what matters most to patients. So I did want to say that that was like, and some had noted that there, everyone in an auditorium is engaged. And so there's groups of folks out there that are listening. Um, and so before we start getting into some, there's some themes, so I'll break it up. Um, but let's ask the question that we started the day off with, or the, the session off, which is now, I guess it's mm -hmm. now after now. hearing all yeah. of that, if the answer is not always, um, we haven't done our job, but now, how often will you incorporate bowel urgency assessments into your evaluation of patients with Crohn's disease? That's great. Oh, thank you, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Our job is done. You. Um, all right, let's 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 dig in. I know there are, the people may still, this is amazing. Thank you, everyone, and really sees, again, 
imagine when we first saw the data and we were yes. involved in yeah. all of this, we're like, this is crazy. This is like something, how could 30 years later I be learning something completely right. I never even thought really was a thing. So that's what's the beauty about IBD is a continual learning experience. So, and hearing from our patients. So SMART goals, just as we wrap up sort of the, con the purpose of and what we want to um, really manifest for it is proactively screen patients with Crohn's for bowel urgency symptoms using a meaningful assessment tool such as the UNRS. Yes, that is for sure because we're kind of highlighting the fact that there's a severity measure here. But just asking a patient whether with Crohn's disease you experience urgency, I'd be happy with. Like right. just low bar, right? Low Ask bar the and then dig in. Yeah. 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 Um, and then um, increase the percentage of patients who have an individualized plan to address bowel urgency during periods when inflammation is controlled. Seriously, like you, your part, although like you noted, it's a lot, it's so critical because there's myths around don't use antidiarrheals yeah. because you may have toxic mega, whatever the concepts around. So there's a lot of questions about loperamide. Oh. So, and improve the proportion of patients with Crohn's who identify their goals for addressing the impact of bowel urgency and other CD symptoms on daily life. So, um, <laughs> you know what another emotion which makes me so happy um, is that there were many responses that said, wow, I'm gonna start asking the question and now I have some answers because I wasn't asking because I didn't know what to do with it. So right. it really, and it made people have an epiphany. So I'm really grateful that uh, you guys were so uh, helpful at this. So tell me about um, the loperamide story and the FODMAP. There was some question about, you know, do you have a certain amount of time that you would say take loperamide? Is it loperamide as needed or always and forever. Tell us a little bit more about how you think about antidiarrheal. So, so the way I think now, um, after learning about this and from some of my experiences also, I'm not that scared about loperamide that mm -hmm. probably I was many years ago. Um, once you start an effective therapy and you know that the inflammation is getting checked, um, you, I, I actually, in my practice, I have started using low-dose loperamide mm -hmm. uh, in these patients to help them give more control to their bowel, especially learning that loperamide can have really good effect on the anal sphincter and the rectal compliance. So actually, it goes along. And there are some actually studies, uh, I was uh, uh, digging deep into loperamide stories that how it affects the, the sodium channels on the opioid receptors and can even modulate some of the inflammation, but this is all theoretical. I mean, it's not like we don't have studies to prove that, and that's not the take home message here, but there's some concept about that uh, it's not as dangerous as it used to be. Um, in my practice, I use scheduled loperamide because I tell my patients, if you have a accident or a bowel movement or an episode and you taking loperamide, it's kind of like putting the cart before the horse. Before the yeah, horse. Yeah. So uh, perhaps just do a schedule one. If you are suffering from nighttime accidents or early morning, just take one loperamide at night. I mean, some of the patients do complain to me that they, are, they get really constipated and I tell them take baby loperamide. Just get the liquid one that we use for babies and just use that a little bit or just try it and play with it a little bit to see all I need is to have you a little bit more control for your incontinence and urgency. Yeah. So Millie, how do you? Well, so it, it, I actually do, you know, many of us have been using loperamide for a long time, particularly in our pouch patients or patients who've had surgery, et cetera. But one of the things you have to do is you have to tell your patient, you know, when they go to buy this at the pharmacy, on the bottle it clearly says, do not take regularly. Yeah. And I emphasize to my patients, that's because we don't want someone who is undiagnosed out there having terrible diarrhea who hasn't sought investigation. We know where your diarrhea comes from. We know your inflammation is under control. There's no danger to you in chronically using this. I think we have to emphasize this, that because every bottle is marked that way. And we, we want that because I don't want, we want to be able to diagnose patients appropriately. But remember that we have 40, 50 years of data surrounding chronic loperamide use in post-surgical states, so. Okay, we're up to 60. Um, so we're gonna be here all night, just kidding. So um, probably the most important comment was that someone wants my shoes. I thought I should just say that. Excellent. So, yeah. Someone virtually, thank you, thank you. But that was a really Excellent. important comment. So I think that really, we should just end it right there. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so um, 
how do we tell a patient and validate that this is not acceptable? And how do you separate that this endo remission, histo remission, but yet patients, you know, we need to bridge that gap, but tell them that we could do better. How do you, how do you message that to your patients? It's a hard message, and I think I try to have the patient help me to get there. Because some of my patients, they come in, they say, what's remission? I don't know what remission is. They've never actually been well since their diagnosis. And so coming up with what remission means to them, and then it often is these factors. It's the quality of life. It's going to dinner with friends. It's not having to map out every bathroom like McCall did. And so we say, OK. Here's the goal, how are we gonna get there? Number one is controlling the inflammation, but then we, need to, we know that we need to continue to address the other steps until we get to that individualized remission. And I think that has really helped me because oftentimes what you hear from your patients, it's not you know, two bowel movements, it's, it's not CDAI. It, it is very much other factors that mean yeah. remission to them. And I, I would just echo uh, the same thing that number one, we need to, uh, how you frame your question and how you're asking these questions and how you're describing your management goals. And I learned hard way about six years ago when I was writing my first book for Crohn's and Colitis for Dummies. I had a technical editor who would just come to me every evening and ask me, what does the inflammation mean? And it never occurred to me that even the word inflammation patient may not even know. They can confuse inflammation with infection mm -hmm. and or many other things. So, so making sure that what you're saying to your patient the patient is understanding that. Right. And then the second thing, I think you can't just do it by yourself. You need to have a team, a support team to help uh, your patient. So I, I really truly believe that uh, when you're caring for an IBD patient, you need a team, uh, a, a, a strong supporting team that is helping them. Not only that 15 minute visit uh, will not do justice to those patients. So remember, Care really happens when they leave the office. Yes. Yeah. Right. And then they're left to self-manage, often trying to find what's on the internet. Yeah. And if we're not, you know, we believe ourselves to be the center of truth. If we're, you know, in essence, we're like, don't believe everything you right. read on the internet. But we have to have solutions. So they wouldn't want to look for, self you know, patients in general aren't self-managing if they had the information and felt empowered yeah that they were in control. So I think the more we can do to sort of validate and say we could do better and here are some ways. Right. There's a lot of questions on fatigue. You showed in music that um, fatigue and urgency, Dave Rubin showed at DW fatigue and urgency in, in the UC population, um, they're related. Does that come into this holistic approach? Should we be thinking of fatigue, urgency, pain? You showed the bubbles of those right. PROs. Yeah. I think absolutely, and it, it, they're, they're very much interrelated. I mean, if you're getting up at night and not having good sleep hygiene because you're going to the bathroom because you're having urgency, it's clearly gonna affect your fatigue. It's, clear, it's all interrelated. It, we, this came up with sexual health and sexual dysfunction, very much interrelated with uh, the fear of, uh, of urgency, and so, I think that as we address each of these components, we, the others will potentially improve as well. Um, you know, one of the, there was a question around women in particular, and I wanna mm -hmm. just add my two cents around pelvic floor, and yeah. we don't ask enough. Again, this yeah. goes back to the sexual quality of life or sexual dysfunction, but it's more, um, there's a huge relationship between this pelvic floor dysfunction and someone who has a lot of urgency who is, um, you know, constantly brain gutting or brain anal sphincter thought process about the, and the anxiety around it and just constant state of sort of squeezing your, you know, right. the, the pelvic floor and the sphincters that we absolutely underestimate the impact of IBD on the pelvic floor. And I have women who come to me um, for preconception counseling, and I routinely will ask about vaginismus, painful intercourse, there's a whole discussion around that as well. And a lot of it is, even my discussion about C-section mm -hmm. versus vaginal delivery in a woman who has severe pelvic, pelvic floor, there's a lot we do not dive into, and right. it is very much intimately tied to urgency. And so I think 
There's a lot more to be done. I feel like we have a lot of work, but we just started to scratch the surface clearly because like finally we're talking about it for God's sakes. We had to wait for an anonymous survey to actually <laughs> ask the question. We weren't doing it ourselves. I mean, that's insane too. Um, so again, we've had a lot of epiphanies over the last mm -hmm. like four or five years around this uh, confide survey in particular and some of the work in music. And so talk about the scale and how we measure. So point number one from the SMART goals. Um, we showed that there was a seven day and then there mm -hmm. was an average. I would like to share that just asking one day's worth of urgency is probably yeah. enough. Do you, and there was a lot of questions. I want to ask this question, can my MAs or can my Absolutely. nurses, should we just integrate this into yeah. Epic? If you have an Epic pre-question survey, if you normally take in um, you know, a new patient visit where you get a detailed history that they write things down, ask them. You know, the, it can be used in a couple of different fashions. When we used it in music, and as they did in the clinical trial, a zero or one is considered bowel urgency remission, and everything else, um, you know, obviously is, is having urgency. But there's a lot of use in being able to understand where on the scale they are, because that severe urgency, as Marla mentioned, bringing someone down even three points into moderate can have a dramatic impact on their quality of life. So it's something you can longitudinally track, um, and it's very easy to do. It's self-explanatory, patients get it. It's a scale, they circle where they are. Yeah, not only patients can uh, do that, um, you can very easily integrate in your EMR through a smart phrase or something and actually develop this, and it's very easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, developing an HBI or CDI, I mean, that's a nightmare to develop in, for example, <laughs> an EPIC tool, yeah. but this is so easy, it's just numeric, and uh, you can even find this and just do that, and your scribe, your MA can do it, and the cool yeah. thing, as you were saying, is that you can celebrate when you see the scale is, scale is improving, yeah. and you can see like, oh, look, your urgency is improving, and that's something we should celebrate, so I think that's, and, and you could ask them, in, just as Marla said, the question could be, in the past 24 hours, you know, yeah. how, have, how has your urgency been? But you can also say, in the past week, or yeah. consider an average 24-hour yes. period. You don't need the daily measurement. Yeah. Um, this, that can, it can still be utilized. Yeah, we showed that just asking that sort of equates to or averages out. Mm -hmm. I mean, <clears throat> I think the fact that you can measure, and I showed that, you know, you showed a difference at zero right. to 12, for example. We knew that at least a three-point change, so now all of us could sort of put that on our radar if we were to integrate it and ask zero to 10, and next visit, and you write down that it's a nine, and then shortly thereafter, just like you're measuring rectal bleeding, whether you're measuring right. stool frequency, what does it matter? Now you're asking about bowel urgency severity. I've just added it now to how I feel I am moving in the right direction with this, um, with this therapy. And actually, um, the UC Mary uh, Lucent trials are published in the New England Journal, and it did, we measured bowel urgency remission, so zero, one, two. So if you looked at, you could see what was defined as remission, because there was a lot of questions around defining remission, and we'll have that in some as the Crohn's data starts to come out. There was a lot of questions about, has other therapies applied the UNRS? I noted, so for example, atrazomod, there is data in UC applying the uh, urgency NRS. Um, TL1A, the Prometheus Now Merck uh, asset, also use the UNRS, so you're gonna to start to see a lot more application of it to a point where it's gonna become standard. standard. And mm -hmm. so the beauty is, is that you can get ahead of it and be ahead of the curve because you really heard sort of the importance and some of the nuances around it. Um, there was also about, because they were asked whether the FDA, and so I think really the fact that all this tremendous work has been done to actually validate it was, an, a huge lift, and I think a huge value add to the to the community. So I think it's important that we can start to dive in um, and really think about uh, how to capture it. Now there was a question: Is that so? Does that mean that I should be optimizing my therapies based on urgency? I think that's that I got you know. Tell me how you approach right. that, and what's your bar to say, I need to optimize the therapy, or do I do everything you just told me to do? Well, I think you're not practicing in like a silos. A you know, we're not yeah. just using symptoms alone. We're using biologic markers, whether that be a calprotectin, or maybe you've scoped them, or Marla, I'm gonna say it, 
perhaps you've done an intestinal ultrasound to assess objectively <laughs> yes. um, whether they have inflammation. So I think when we put all the pieces of information together, it helps you to determine that. But remember what I showed you in our, our music study where, yes, people who had active disease, 87% of them had urgency, but among those in remission, it was still 48%. And so there, it, it's not a direct correlation. So I think we need to understand in relation to other testing as well. I don't know how you, if they yeah, do agree testing. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And sometimes you just have to do it together uh, concomitantly where you're offering the therapy, optimizing the therapy, and just understanding uh, it could be as simple as just introducing low FODMAP diet while you are starting a new therapy. Or it could be as simple as um, if you feel like this is a pelvic floor issue, just sending them yeah. for a physical therapist yeah. also. At the same time, you don't have to uh, create a sequence or, or an algorithm. You can just see what your patient need and what, 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 what we can do to help. I, I've been impressed by how many patients actually respond to cholestyrene for bile yes. acid malabsorption too. And I will actually often concurrently, particularly if they've had a prior resection, you know that's a component of yeah. this. So treating concurrently can help you to get Yeah, it's like 90%. And yeah. Even without resection, 30% of the patients had yeah. bile acid malabsorption. A and couple of, um, thank you, a couple of points here is it said, you know, glass half empty, glass half full. Many patients still report urgency despite our fabulous advanced therapies right. and, and the depth of remission. And some folks are even proposing disease clearance and we have patients who can't even leave their house. So how disconnected are we? <laughs> really, I'm serious here. But it's interesting, the idea that the question was, you know, it just means that we don't have enough, um, we don't know how to really treat this symptom, but I think what I'm seeing is it's multifactorial, therefore you can't just assume, just like we assume one drug may be the solution to all people right. with IBD, it doesn't even make any sense. So I think the concept that this is multifactorial and therefore we need to have a more sort of holistic, as you noted, but yeah. holistic means the physical, the mental, the emotion, all of that yeah. needs to be in place. So I think you brought that out. One other point is with perianal Crohn's disease, oh. we didn't, and we should have actually talked a little bit about it. I just got Think triggered because someone floor. said, yeah. is stem cell part of it? And it just made me realize thinking about perianal fistulas, but a lot of our patients who've lost, if there's a defect in the wall of the sphincter, they may have these issues as well. So part of it is also aggressively, please treat the perianal disease. And that's right. for another day because we are actually, Crazy, 70 questions, it's amazing. Um, so thank you everybody. So, so Marla, I know you're about to wrap up, but I, I wanna give a, a call out. She's not here with us, but I just wanted to say a thank you to McCall, if she happens to be among the virtual audience, because I think all of us learned so much from her and Tasseep, thank you for involving her in the program. And just, I think we've gotta say that loud and clear. No, absolutely. Um, it's on my list of- Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't read the list, clearly. I didn't do my home, pre-homework. didn't do the homework. <laughs> but anyways, no. Um, I think what I what I feel is the bravery. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That that to me is like really, you know, mission critical. So um, again, thank you everybody. Like so being so engaged and so interested in the story is just really amazing for us because this is what, as noted at the beginning, this is what we do and why we do what we do. So really appreciate everybody's uh, interest, particularly in my shoes. So today's activity, because <laughs> I've had a number by the way. So Nobody today's activity um, will be available on the gastroenterology hub on CME Outfitters website. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff also to um, go through uh, on there that you'll really get some, um, see some great assets and information. And um, both of you, in addition to McCall, but yes, uh, all of you for being here and staying here and virtually, and mostly the two of you, because really, you really took this program to a whole other level. So thank you, really. Thank and you have all. a great Thanks. rest of the night. Yeah.